This is where business ideas and passions turn into profit. Whether you're dreaming of becoming your own boss, but don't know how to get started, or have already started a side hustle and wish to grow it exponentially, your host, Victoria Wick, can help you turn your passion-based business ideas into profit. Welcome to Million Dollar Passion. Here is your host, world-renowned jewelry designer and home shopping TV celebrity, Victoria Wick. Welcome to another episode of the Million Dollar Passion Podcast. As I say uh, week after week, basically there are two reasons why most small businesses fail. The first reason is lack of funding. And the second reason is lack of visibility. That's my opinion. It's not you know, something that's um, it's a widely understood, but uh, many of you who are listening to this show probably can relate to that at some point in your life. You've probably gone through that phase or maybe you're in that now. So my guest today, Joe Sakela, is just an amazing person and also has, I want to say, extreme expertise because this guy's done everything. He's written articles, he's helped people, he's founded a, you know, he's founding a stock exchange, all those things. And um, I thought I'd just invite him over and see what it takes to get some money for your businesses. So without further ado, and you know, we'll get into Joe's credentials and all the things he's done and how he became the expert and how he helps you. I just want to welcome him and have him tell his story, uh, because I think he's a lot more interesting when he tells his story rather than me relating it to you. So welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to really sharing my story. Your audience and the entrepreneurial world is very, very, it is my million dollar passion to, to use your yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, well, helping other people. I mean, obviously, you've got with the with the credentials you have and all the things you've accomplished. I mean, okay, I have never actually. I've been on TV for twenty three years, and I met a lot of famous people, and I met a lot of people with a lot of interesting. You know, I'm not just you know tooting my horn, but I, what mm-hmm. I want to tell you is that I've never known anyone who's written an article in the Oxford University's handbook. In fact, I know like two people who actually went to Oxford, one of them went on a tourist visa vacation, and the other one actually attended the school. So you've done all of this work. Tell me a little bit about your early you know, uh, background, because sometimes your early life uh, kind of shapes what you do you know, to, later on down the line. Is there any point in your life that kind of shaped you in the financial world and specifically um, how you have now shared that knowledge to, you know, enable, you know, hundreds, thousands of people to transform their lives? Yeah, I, actually, wonderful question. And thank you for asking that. So, yeah, I grew up in North Austin in Chicago, which is, um, it, it's, it's widely regarded today as one, one of the most, uh, I guess, violent and kind of suppressed areas in our country. Um, so I, I'm not, a, I'm not a child of, of privilege. I grew up in a very, with a very common, my father was a, was a union worker. And so my background, I'm, I'm born out of hardworking people. And, uh, I, I was among the first two people in my family to go to college and to go to professional school and, uh, became a lawyer. And a lot of my career, 20, more than 25 years of my career, I spent representing, um, you know, angel investors and venture capitalists to evaluate the companies that they were going to invest in. And so the bulk of my career was representing people with money on how they view a small company or a small opportunity to see how it would proceed. But out of my kind of what shaped me was I began to notice that the best ideas and the best companies are not necessarily born of the best pedigree. Um, they come from everywhere. They come from small communities. They, entrepreneurs are, are every one of us today. So, uh, and, I, and then in noticing that, I can talk to this more later, but the, the point is I began to realize that what we have to do as finance professionals is help uh, the investors to locate the most imaginative, best companies and usually when we do that, we, we find that those are products and services that help the world survive better. You know, the, yeah. the invention of things comes from every area in all walks of life. And the things that we need to help one another get along and live a better and I guess more, uh, you know, a more easy, easy life. They don't all, they're not always born in, a, in an expensive laboratory somewhere. So rarely. 
horn in yeah, the yeah, in yeah. fact you're right yeah. and so yeah. i kind of took my experiences in life and started to channel them into using finance and using the expertise that i have into helping those companies uh, kind of I, I guess i switched sides if you will help the company to learn a, a very valuable process of how to communicate with investors and how to keep graduating to ever increasingly more investment funds. So the two problems you outlined, at least one of them can disappear entirely, which is we don't want the ideas to die by virtue of a lack of our own uh, dedication to funding them. Right. So that's, that's how we've gotten here. So Joe, I mean, first of all, for those of you who are listening, I didn't mention this, but Joe is actually a uh, licensed CPA and a lawyer. And um, so he's in a perfect position to give you the straightforward financials, but also the legal side of this, because every any time and every time you uh, raise money, you put anything on paper. If you try to go get a loan for a home nowadays, it's like a, it's like a phone book thick of you know things that you have to sign, right? Yeah. So having that legal background, uh, making sure that there's 100% transparency for both the venture capitalist who's investing money in you, as well as the person who's seeking funding. Um, you're in that perfect position to actually, you know, see the maybe potential problems down the road. So you don't have to go actually hire a separate lawyer. Um, the other thing I love what you've done is that you were, when you were working for this venture capitalist, you actually had a front seat on what they're looking for, how they view your type of business, um, and when they're most likely to fund something. Um, I mean, I'm not a venture capitalist. I've never actually looked for money. I should have, um, but I have not. So are there, um, what are, what are venture capitalists looking for? And um, when is like, is there a good time versus, you know, less good time or less desirable time to look for funding? So yeah, another good question. So the quick answer to the good time is um, th there's no time like the present. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's good. And, and so what you have to really evaluate is, you know, what, what stage of develop, business development are you, which will then inform you as to what type of investor is needed at your stage. So, right. and so for example, the very earliest stage companies, um, the, the angel investor, uh, people like to call it the family and friends rounds of money, the, those initial launch monies, seed investing. Um, it's, it's always a good practice to begin the communication and transparency. I can't, I can't emphasize transparency enough because especially the early stage investor, if, you, if they understand your obstacles well and you're honest about your obstacles, it's my experience for all the years I've been doing this that the investor is rooting for you, especially if they are interested in the investment. So, okay. you know, the, and that's really the first evaluation is, um, you know, if you're making something or you have a technology or you're creating some particular product, um, those early investors have to be pioneers with you. They have to really have interest in your version of what help is. And then they'll support you and they tend to support you through the earliest stage struggles. And that's what's in Oxford's handbook. You know, the, when you look at what we've written, you can actually identify the particular characteristics of companies that make it. And, you, you know, you have to do a bit of your own self-study. Um, there are organizations like ours that are willing to help with that. But the, the, there is, the, the answer is there's no time like the present. And what you want to communicate first is the, the potential bigness of your idea. How imaginative are you? Because that's what they're interested in. They're interested in, they're, they're not interested in something that is, you know, going to be average. They're interested in the extraordinary. And I find that there are literally tens of thousands of extraordinary people with extraordinary ideas, yet they, they get caught up in all the language of finance and the mechanics of, of uh, financial data and the legalities. And if you're an entrepreneur, really what you want to, to do is Capture the goal of what you're trying to accomplish in its biggest, broadest sense and how, it, how your imagination supports that. That will generate the interest. And once the interest is there, then just be transparent as to what the barriers and obstacles and the road ahead is 
so you can keep people supporting you through those barriers and obstacles. That's what we, that's the primary help that we're delivering in terms of the financial literacy and education and connectivity between investors and entrepreneurs through our current, this is what we're, we're currently doing that. When we're all grown up, we'll actually have a full fledged small business stock exchange. Um, but right now, in an immediate form, that's how we're helping the entrepreneur and uh, strategic investor, strategic consultant alike. That's the, we're doing that today. So if you haven't, if you missed this, the one thing I'm going to um, direct all of you right now listening, um, maybe you're watching us on YouTube, is um, to go to the Oxford University's handbook on IPOs. Main so the Oxford University handbook on IPO. And it's called the Main Street Growth Act, HR 2899. And I think that, um, is this on your website, uh, thedreamexchange.com? It's, it's on our website. Okay. Yeah, you can actually find links to the yeah. legislation and Yeah, because I think, uh, Joe, I think the first thing, um, you know, there are some commonalities um, so that you are not the first one, you know, walking this, this journey. So mm-hmm. a lot of, there's some commonalities on, what makes you a great investment or what makes it investment. So, you know, even, even if you're in pet foods or, you know, whatever that there, and we, and I picked that because I love pets and it's just fresh on my mind because I just picked up my dog's pet food. But I mean, there are a lot of other companies that's done that before, but what makes yours so unique and different and why is this one that has the potential to be, you know, to, because it, basically investors want to know what their payoff is, you know, and they, they're taking a risk on you. So I love that. That um, the other thing I I love what you said um, about what you said is a transparency. I think that you know you got to be transparent about everything. I think one of the problems with small business people is that they have the inability to see themselves. You know, like the obstacles, like they think I, I can get over this or whatever. But you know, I've been on TV for twenty three years, and the only reason I say that is because when you're not transparent, people find out. You know, you're just one click away from 100% transformation, transparent information all the time. So the the minute you're not transparent around something, that's either by misleading, you know, like um, inaccurate information or omitting something altogether. You then lose tr- credibility on everything else you're saying. So I think that transparency is really, it, I think it's a fair thing to do. And I think it also, I recently sold a home in Las Vegas. And I have to tell you, when we had to disclose all the things that's wrong with the house, uh, it was like 52 pages you know, of, of documents that I didn't even know, but I had to kind of uh, put myself in the shoes of the buyer when they come in, like, you know, are, are these things that they would normally expect? I mean, it was a fairly large home and I had to kind of like, I went even as far as like documenting where the ants come in when it, when it rains, because I didn't want to be sued later on, you know? Right. So I, I think that the transparency piece is very important, especially if they're angel investors. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, when it comes to, you know, helping small businesses gain funding, and I just love what you do, I, and I would love to see um, a, a dream, small dream stock exchange for small business owners because they have very specific needs that, you know, that larger companies don't have, which is, you know, uh, they have the imagination, they have the drive, they have the passion, but the thing that they're lacking is funding. And most of the time, when you're running a small business, unless you're in the business of finance, we don't really think about finance to the to the way that you guys do in the financial world. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know how many times I talk to entrepreneurs that tell me, oh, Victoria, you know, I have so many more customers now than ever before. My, you know, top nine revenue is just through the roof. And, um, you know, I have no money. I don't know why I have no money. And you're like, how is it that you don't know you have any money? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. it's true because, you know, they don't understand like, um, well, they're, the they're caught flow. up in the mechanics. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, exactly. me- the mechanics. Um, what you just said is just. I don't. I want to really emphasize it. It's. It's almost a little bit profound. It's. Oh, I'm generating so much yeah. interest. I'm generating so many sales, but the financial mechanics are taking over my life because I don't have two and three and five million dollars in profitability. So, you'll get pushed aside by many investors. And what, what I want to say is that the world has changed. Tesla, the largest electronic auto manufacturer in the world, did not have a profitable quarter 
until last July. So the, this just, it's kind of, it's a canary in the coal mine that shows what I'm trying to, 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 to uh, impart, which is the idea and the milestones toward accomplishing the idea are far more important in, especially for the early stage company than this overwhelming cash flow profitability. Yeah. If you have a, an idea whose time has come, well, that's of tremendous interest to investors because they know, and that, that's why transparency is so important. If you tell them, look, if I just overcome these three obstacles, right. um, then this is how big this can become. Well, they want to know that. They don't want to know that everything is fine. Yes, sir, three bags full because otherwise, and I've found this to be the case very often, small companies that are highly profitable and are just throwing off buckets and buckets of cash. Well, they're, they're, they're actually not looking for investors very often because right. they have cash. Right. So what is the obstacle? Well, the obstacle is how can I get the funds to expand my idea because it's bigger than merely can I turn an immediate profit? And that those financial mechanics, uh, I'll say it this way. This is one of the, the, I guess, the philosophical underpinnings of the dream exchange itself, which is, uh, you know, throughout our world today, we, we, we know virtually how to solve anything. Human beings are ingenious. We can yeah. create solutions, the how to solve a problem in hundreds of ways. What the investor is actually interested in and what, what, when ideas will become big is why, not how we solve it. Why would we do this? Right. And so, you know, for you, you talked about pets. That would be a, such a highly interesting environment because if you think about a pet, I mean, I think George Carlin once made a joke that, you know, he, he brought home his kitten and he thought, why am I doing this? I'm, I'm buying a tragedy. I'm going to outlive my cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but the fact is we all have, I have three pets. Mm -hmm. We all have them because the reasons why we do things go to the core of the very reason we're alive. Right. And when you're an entrepreneur and you're creating something and it goes to that very core, that's what I mean by look at the big picture, right? Like, why is this going to be so great? There may be many, there may be many, many different mechanical ways to solve right. certain things or to produce something, but people become interested because it enhances their life. It enhances their the joy of living or their ability to survive at all. So that's far more important in a discussion with an entrepreneur. You may not even know this or with a uh, investor. You may not even realize it at first, but they're they're looking for you. They're they're hunting for that early company with the great right. idea that everyone is going to become interested in and that solves a certain equation for how to make life and living a better thing on our planet. So that's far more important than the financial mechanics. If you get lost in that, you may as well just go back to college and get a degree in, in accounting. Th that's not what they're interested. They're interested in you and your idea and their passion and, and how your passion will become a big enterprise someday. That's what they invest in. They don't really invest, you know, if they wanted to invest in something that just provided cash flow, they can buy an apartment building. Yeah. So you know, it's yeah. interesting when you talked about Tesla, I was thinking, I mean, I may, you may have the answer to this. How many years was it before Jeff Bezos turned profit? Oh, was it yeah, like I don't 20 know. years or something? Right. I mean, it was just years when he quarter after quarter after quarter, he'd get on CNBC talking about his vision, what it'll do, all that stuff. And, you know, in the meantime, he had just lost like another hundred million dollars that quarter. Precisely. How, and, and right. How did, he, and how did he go about losing? Think about that. Yeah. How did he go about losing? Uh, who paid for the hundred million dollar loss? His investors. Yeah. They, why? Because they saw that the convenience of Amazon in all of our lives was um, practically one of the biggest ideas. I mean, there are some big ideas out there today, but it's perhaps one of the biggest ideas ever to circulate in our society. It's no wonder the company is worth, you know, billions and billions. I mean, yeah. we have companies that are worth over a trillion dollars today. Right. So you, and what I would say to the entrepreneur is 
you don't have to be a trillion dollar company. You don't have to even have the vision of I'm going to be a trillion dollars to attract a good investor who wants to help, who sees your niche, who will, great. Can we do, can we do 50 million? That would be wonderful um, from where you are today. So that, that, that intermediate benchmark, it's the exact same conversation from raising $1 million to raising $50 million to raising $5 billion. That's the, it's the same interest. So you have to think of the big idea and communicate it with a sufficient amount of transparency, letting them know, you know, so I will say this, I've said this more times in the last three years than ever in my life. Uh, sometimes a very good answer is, I don't know the answer. Right. I don't know. When will this be done? They I don't appreciate know. that. They appreciate the, the transparency that you don't know. I mean, you don't have to know yeah. everything, right? Yeah, I- I'm working on it. We're, we're, this is what we're working on currently. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I, I invented electricity last week. I'm not exactly sure when the light bulb will be finished. Right. Um, that's per- that's a perfectly acceptable solution. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. So now they there. I'm going to come to the a little bit uncomfortable part of this whole conversation and um, not, not so uncomfortable for you because you kind of bucked the trend here, but there was this thought that among small business owners, especially female business owners, especially minority female business owners, that when you talk about venture capitalists, that they're vultures. Uh, You know, I mean, I could have paraphrased it in a softer language, but it's, it's a sure stereotype that, that can work. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I've been there. So, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before. So <clears throat> what would you say to that? How would you kind of explain to somebody that you're not there to be a vulture? You're there to get, basically get them help that they need in exchange for a certain amount of money. And that um, I personally know some friends who actually were, there was a fitness instructor, you know, she was uh, having a tough time just getting 10 people in her living room to teach fitness classes. And eventually she ended up, uh, you know, there was a, an investor who believed in the, this was years ago, like 30 years ago, they believed in the idea of fitness and all that stuff. So they basically, you know, this guy invested a million dollars uh, in our business and, uh, but it was in exchange for a lot of things. So when the uh, brand was doing, you know, two, $300 million a year, uh, she wanted to change the deal. You know, this, this growth happened very quickly too. And, uh, you know, she uh, cried wolf about the unfairness of the deal. So his whole um, response to that was, look, without me, you'd still be coaching, you know, the fitness classes and in not being able to pay rent because, you know, she had like these little flyers at the grocery store. She actually knew somebody who knew somebody who basically mm-hmm. invested this money. Mm-hmm. So I actually see both sides of it. So what would you, um, how would you kind of uh, go about um, bucking that? Yeah, statement? yeah, totally. So the, you, 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 everyone, venture capitalist, angel investor, and entrepreneur, everyone alike, you have to take a viewpoint, especially in the earliest stages of your business, that you're, you're creating a relationship. It is a relationship-driven uh, environment. Right. And that's where, like what I'm saying right now, you know, years of financial and mechanical training that I've had, uh, you know, I'm sure I'd have professors who would scream at me right now. But the point is that relationship has to have fundamental fairness. In other words, at the earliest stage, the investor is looking at the idea and the entrepreneur is looking at the need for money. And there's this balance that one has to strike. We actually have a formula called equilibrium pricing, where what is fundamentally fair in the outset of the business may eventually become unfair as time goes by because the importance of the million dollars when you have the studio of 10 people Mm -hmm. is clearly significantly higher than when the brand is a national brand and it's all over the United States. And the reward for the person who had the idea very often in in the earliest stage can include terms that are suppressive to the person who's creating. Now, here's what's important about the story you just you just articulated the external world to the business is where the real barriers to expansion exist. What you want to make sure of is that internally you don't create a disincentive between the investor and the entrepreneur. In other words, 
if you're working and it's so suppressive that it, the next dollar you make, 99 cent of, cents of it has to go to your investors, well, really, what's your incentive as an entrepreneur to make your idea great any longer? Right. So at some point, there's an equilibrium. There is an equilibrium point. It's like where the things start to turn that they're not really fair for one party or the other. Now, the reason that he's saying that most of the venture capitalists and some of them, it's an appropriate name, vulture capitalists, because there are just people who do suppress. Um, On the other hand, there are good investors and they say, well, here we are today with my million dollars and your very good idea. In five years, if we've gone through my million dollars and your idea turns out to be worth less than what I paid for it, that they'll be, we'll be sitting with your bad idea and my million dollars will be gone. Right. Now that's just a justification for an investor not being able to estimate well enough how that entrepreneur will perform. Right. So that's where the transparency and the barriers And you providing enough information to say, okay, if this in fact does go as big as it is, these are the rewards I'm going to expect from you. Right. If you're a million dollars, because it does become unfair where the the person who merely wrote a check, that was their effort. They wrote a check. And the entrepreneur went through the slavery and the sweat labor and the worrisome nights of getting that business moving. Well, someday, if the million dollars is worth 100 million and the whole company is only worth 110 million, it's patently unfair to say that that million dollars created the totality of that business. That's not true yeah. because Agreed. his money was just money. Yeah. It, it, any other million dollars would have done it. And him saying, well, I believed in you way back when doesn't somehow create fundamental fairness or resolve the injustice that only the money got really, really wealthy and the entrepreneur is going to go on to their next entrepreneurship, again, not paying rent with a new idea. So there's a balance to that. And we help with that. That's one of the things is getting your relationship intact with your earliest investors to assure that they're aligned behind the purposes and want to see you flourish and prosper as much as they do. Yeah, no, I... I, that's a piece of information I didn't know. And I think I knew these people personally. And I think um, that may have been one of the reasons why I never looked for investors, you know, in yeah. my career. Um, so now if somebody wanted to, if, you know, any of my listeners, in fact, I know uh, several of my listeners personally pretty well, and they actually have some just crazy, amazing ideas like the next invention. Um, and they're, you know, running, you know, pretty decent businesses right now. If they're trying to find uh, money, uh, would you recommend that they actually do some kind of a package together? Or is that something you help out with, you know, like their vision, their mission and all that stuff or, you know, what they're doing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, like I said, what are we doing today? Because we're not open as a stock exchange and probably won't be for another year. But so we, we do have a, a social media site called DreamX Connect. Okay. And what, does, what we've designed the social media site to do is to be a menu-driven um, identity. It's a menu-driven way that you can put your profile into an environment where you as the uh, entrepreneur, you don't have to really think through all the potential questions that someone's going to ask to become, and I call it strategically involved. Right. So. If you, if you follow the menus of DreamX Connect and you create a profile, and we probably have, we, we've just started, we have like 2,000 uh, personalities in there already, yeah. both, uh, both strategic consultants, investors, as well as entrepreneurs. And if you follow the menus, there's also the ability to put in your own, you know, your own PowerPoints, your own videos, your own, all of the, the that you'd normally a, a social with social media, right? And right. then we have an internal messaging board. So you can actually search among the investors and people who've created profiles for someone who would be strategically aligned with you. Right. And then you can custom make the packaging. And we actually have other products that are designed to help with the mechanics, because as soon as you start, what's the package look like? Well, what are the key mechanical financial uh, forecasts and ways to communicate to the investor? Well, we have a lot of resources 
through DreamX Connect that will help you if you start your relationship. So if you find an investor and the two of you are interested, there's some products we have that will help facilitate how you communicate with one another after you've done your online social media exercise. Um, and you can search and you know, the, the investors have profiles. They, they say, I only invest in the earliest stage companies, or right? I'm, I'm only interested in, you know, uh, you know, environmentally sound companies or companies that do wastewater management, whatever their profile says, you're, you're, you can ser- search within the uh, DreamX Connect environment and begin the relationship process. Um, and that's, that will drive what goes into the packaging because you're, you are your packaging, you're selling your, you're selling some part of your company. So you really have to, you know, put the best appearance on it, transparently letting them know what it is they're going to eventually be be involved in. So we have a lot of tools to help through DreamX Connect. Um, so actually, what you're describing is that the DreamX Connect is almost like a platform where the um, the investors can search for the right uh, investment that they want to get involved in, or their next big idea they want to invest in. And then you have a bunch of people that have great ideas looking for funding. And I think that's really great. You know, what you're describing reminds me a little bit of the in the retail environment. Like I'm in retail and, you know, so many people approach me. And they want to get on TV. They want their products on TV. And they'll ask me, oh, my God, how do I pitch them and all that? And then I said the same thing that you basically said, which is that the buyers um, of, you know, all the department stores, the Saks Fifth Avenue, and the Eman Marcus, you know, all those buyers of, they're busy. But, and I've dealt with all of them, by the way, you know, and I say all, like the only ones that I haven't really dealt with are Target and Walmart in this country. And I've done, you know, TV, duty-free, all that. Those professional buyers, their job is to buy every day something. So they are looking for the next thing, right? In their category. Um, Just like people who are professional investors, they're pretty good at what they do and they know what they're looking for. And they are looking for the next big idea that could be shaped into you know, something that improve lives or add value, Mm -hmm. things like that. So, you know, it's not like you are begging for their sympathy money. You're really asking to be discovered for for your thing. Joe, I think you have given me um, a lot of information, our our listeners, a lot of information, and I love what you do. And I love how you broke down the funding issue, because it's not necessarily for big companies with all the CPAs and lawyers on their team to... Mm -hmm. You don't have to necessarily get to that point before you look for money and that you're creating this uh, stock exchange for small business owners specifically, because I think there are so many more small business business owners than the, the big companies out there that could use it. So I love what you do, all the you know things that you've done to make it easy, uh, you know, financial markets, you know, more accessible and easier understood than um, before you came on the show. Um, Is there any um, comments you have for, and by the way, for for those of you who think that you, you are not looking for money, I would say to go ahead and check out Joe's um, website anyway, because one of the things that small business people are horrible about is having any kind of exit strategy. Um, You know, I think of so many businesses that, I mean, and I know you can too in Chicago, you know, there's a lot of people Uh, family-owned businesses, family-owned restaurants has been there for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And then the next generation of people come in and they don't want to have to do with that. And there's all that equity, all that trust, all that goodwill that just goes out the window. So sometimes it's better to have some sort of an idea of what your business is worth, you know, how attractive it would be if you have to actually get out. So having that, you know, some sort of a pulse on uh, mm-hmm. Your assets, your branding, um, you know, I think that would be really helpful to everybody. Uh, it yes. Just, you know, well. What you said is another profound statement. It takes about three years of planning to right. properly exit. And um, when you say exit strategy, you can't, so I'm going to sell my business tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I need to sell know, it tomorrow. That's worse. <laughs> then you're in trouble, right? Yeah, I need yeah. to sell tomorrow. So it takes it. That's why c- catching the earliest involvement you can get to prepare yourself for the eventuality of dealing with the financial professionals, the consultants, the lawyers, the all that laboring work. It's not something you become educated in overnight. So the, okay. the earliest possible communication and, and at the earliest possible stage. So you're planning at every step along the way 
to properly exit and, you know, protect your wealth that you've put your life's work into. That's, that is the main purpose of the dream exchange to create a financial marketplace where people are able to harvest the wealth of years of their life's energy being poured into a business and, and, and not have it just, as you said, go by the boards because they didn't plan to properly exit. Yeah. And I love the, uh, your branding, uh, dream exchange. It just, uh, it's just kind of, it's catchy and it, and it sticks, you know, right there too. Um, any, uh, parting, uh, words of wisdom to the audience here? I mean, to the, to the entrepreneurs, I, um, I, I have two words on uh, the, the two words that are just near and dear to my heart is never quit. And to the investors, it's a similar, a little more wordy, but you, you know, you only lose your money when you sell. Uh, you, so, yeah. you know, if you don't quit and the investor doesn't decide to, to quit on you as well, and you really keep working to stay dedicated and there's, there are bad days, there are bad entrepreneurial days. Yeah. Um, you just have to not quit, get through them. Yeah. The funds will come, the sales will come. I think it was, uh, Thomas Edison who was asked, my gosh, you know, it took you 4,000 tries to develop the light bulb. How do you feel about that? You know, you, you failed 3,999 times. He said, no, I learned 3,999 ways to not make a light bulb. Right. And, and that's just all it is. You just have to keep the intestinal fortitude to keep going until your light bulb turns on. Yeah. And that's because I meet these people every day. I'm on your side. The world is on your side. Uh, you have friends, you have resources, people are willing to help you. And just, you have to reach for the proper relationship to get the help you need to see your ideas come in your, that's the dream to, to see your dreams come true with your, with your small business. That's what we're all about at the dream exchange. So go check out Joe's um, social media, the dream exchange, and then you can find out all about the articles he wrote um, and all of his uh, astonishing accomplishments on dreamx.com. So it's dream ex like exchange.com. And, and all of this will be in, uh, in the show notes as well. And uh, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your knowledge, expertise, and your passion, Joe. And for those of you who are listening, make sure that you share this episode because when we share our knowledge, when we share our passion, we, it just you know, goes uh, one step closer to uh, living a better world, lifting everybody else. Um, it's time to stop competing. It is time to collaborate with everyone. Until next time, uh, please stay healthy and happy. And as I always say, that happiness is a choice, and I hope you make great choices this week. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Million Dollar Passion, where we turn dreams into reality and passion into profit. According to ancient Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Congratulations on taking that first step today. For more information on how Victoria can help you turn your business idea into a million dollars and to download Victoria's free ebook on passion-based business ideas, visit milliondollarpassion.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcast player.